The following podcast is based on the Cambridge A-Level History Curriculum. Greetings podcast listeners. In this episode, we will be looking at how fascists controlled life in Italy. A few examples of life in Italy include religion, education, and the fascist treatment of women, and we'll be looking at these various topics today. Let's begin with Mussolini's dealings with the church. Until 1870, popes had control over the papal states, which were the regional territories outside of city walls. However, during the Franco-Prussian War, the French army which was stationed in Rome to protect the churches was sent to Prussia to protect France. As a result, King Victor Emmanuel II was able to take control of Rome, unifying Italy. Angered by their loss of power, there was negative sentiment between the church and the state for the next 60 years. When Mussolini was elected to Parliament in 1921, he made a speech embracing the idea of a Christian nation. Pope Pius XI began to think that Mussolini might be the person sent by God to end the separation of the church and the state and to restore the power of the church. So why would Pope XI support the fascist government? Well, the Pope's disliked parliamentary democracy as it meant it was difficult for the church to make a lasting agreement with the government in power. The popes were also opposed to freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of conscience, and freedom of religion as it impacted their power. In the early years of fascism, Mussolini began to improve the relationship between the church and the state that had been sour since the Franco-Prussian War. In 1923, he increased clerical salaries, reinstated religion into elementary school education, and the crucifix was restored in school classrooms and courtrooms. Upon negotiating the Lateran Pax in 1929, he took even bigger steps to build a good relationship with the Church. First, he signed the Lateran Treaty, which recognised the Vatican City as a sovereign state, whilst Pope Pius XI recognised Rome as the capital of the Kingdom of Italy. Secondly, under the Financial Convention of the Pax, the Church was given 750 million lire, with the addition of 100 million lire, in bonds as compensation for the lands which were lost during the Italian unification. This made the Church the largest holder in state bonds. Thirdly, the Pax included the Concordat. It recognised Catholicism as the sole religion of the state. Church marriages were recognised by the state, and the Church had control over divorces. The state was allowed to veto major church appointments, religious education was implemented in elementary and secondary schools from then on, and the state also accepted the existence of Catholic Action, which was an international body that the church had set up in 1863 in order to defend themselves. However, these agreements were not popular among all fascists, and especially not among all of the priests. Firstly, radical fascists considered the Concordat a betrayal of the aims of fascism, as the church held a large amount of influence and power. Meanwhile, the various ranks in the hierarchy of the church had differing views towards fascism. While the Archbishop of Milan openly praised fascism, 300 of his priests circulated open letters of protest saying that good Catholics do not accept fascism. There was a conflict between the fascist state and the church in the 1930s, Mussolini's actions were labelled as heretical by the church. They disliked that Mussolini insisted on and actually made it law that he be referred to as juice with capitalised letters, and he was treated sort of like a god. It even seemed that fascist religion was literally Mussolini. In 1931, Mussolini and the Pope disagreed over Catholic action, with fascists believing it held too much influence, and as a result, closing some branches. Due to this, the Pope published a critical encyclical called Non abbiamo bisogno, meaning we have no need. Mussolini disliked the political involvement of the Church, and the Pope decided to reach a compromise with the state in the end. Catholic action would run strictly religious, educational and recreational activities, and it became decentralised. Later on, in 1938, the Pope was especially critical of the anti-Semitic policies implemented by Mussolini, which were inspired by Nazi Germany. On to Mussolini's approach to education. During their time in power, the fascists revamped the education system. It became racist, biased, and served as propaganda, teaching children to have national pride and to be submissive to the fascist control. Fascist education aimed at ensuring total discipline, brainwashing and indoctrinating the youth by educating them on the good aspects and policies of fascism in order to maintain the support and control over the entire country. Education in Italy was solely pro-fascism. 
This meant that students grew up supporting fascism and right-wing views, and they had a strong sense of nationalism and loyalty to the fascist state. As a result of the church signing various agreements with the fascist government, there were a few changes to school life. In 1923, religious education was made a compulsory subject for primary school students, and this became the same for secondary school students in 1929. Also, prayers were carried out two times during each school day, as Christianity was established as the national religion. The government made other changes to the curriculum, largely with the purposes of indoctrinating the youth and ensuring their support. In 1926, 101 out of 317 historical texts were banned. The fascists introduced official mandatory course plans into the education system, with a single textbook created by the government in 1928, which covered all subjects for each year of elementary school. To solidify the national Italian identity, all dialects were banned, while military education, which was about the good elements of Italian history and taught of weapons and tactics, was introduced in 1935, enhancing national pride. Lessons on fascist culture were introduced in elementary schools the following year, whilst anti-Semitic policies taken from Nazi Germany were implemented into school curriculums. From 1925, the fascists began to take a number of measures to control the teachers. That year, they made it so public employees with anti-fascist views could be easily dismissed. As a result, in order to keep their jobs, they were forced to teach content that they didn't necessarily agree with. In 1929, after the Concordat, which introduced religious education into secondary schools, was signed, teachers were required to take an oath of loyalty to Mussolini. In 1931, teachers' associations were combined to form a fascist association, which organised indoctrination courses that teachers had to take in order to receive any promotions. That same year, professors began to receive instructions to take the oath of loyalty, with only 11 out of more than 1,250 refusing to take the oath of loyalty, with many taking the oath with their fingers crossed as they did not agree with the fascist party. Gradually, teachers were forced to become members of the fascist association, with new educators after 1933 required to become members, and it becoming compulsory for all teachers to be members after 1937. In 1934, teachers were instructed to express national pride by wearing fascist uniforms on official occasions. They were also encouraged to become leaders of the fascist youth organization Opera Nazionale Balila, often referred to as OMB. In line with the policies of Nazi Germany, racial doctrines in 1938 meant that Jewish teachers were dismissed and Jewish students were kicked out of their schools. Aside from forcing professors to take oaths, they didn't really enact any policies on universities, as long as these universities did not express hostility towards the fascist government. Outside of school time, the fascists also organised a number of fascist youth movements with activities for students. The OMB consisted of subgroups for boys and girls, ranging from the ages of 6 to 18. It was run by the party from 1926 until 1929, then the Education Ministry, until 1937, when it was replaced by Gioventù Italiano del Ettorio, GIL. Similar to Nazi Germany's youth organisations, they covered a range of activities from sports and military drills to propaganda lectures. They also organised the Fascio Giovanale del Littorio from 1930 for youths aged 18 to 21 who were not at university, and Gruppi Universitari Fascisti for youths aged 18 to 21 who were studying at university. But really, by the late 1930s, was any opposition likely from students who had been brainwashed by pro-fascist propaganda? Fascist education was really quite effective. There are 20 years of students who would have experienced fascist indoctrination for at least a few years. And meanwhile, Mussolini was also able to decrease the percentage of the population that was illiterate from 27% in 1921 to 17% in 1936, as he increased government expenditure on education from 4% in 1922 to 8% between 1926 and 1935. Now onto the views that Mussolini held towards women and the policies which he imposed. Let's go through some of the fascist belief towards women. 
Fascists believe that women should be submissive to their husbands, their workplaces in the home and they should look after their family. Women should be tender and gentle. Women shouldn't be taken seriously. Women must obey. Women should not be intellectual and thus not receive higher education. Women should bear children. Women should be good wives and mothers where their main mission should be caring for families and giving birth. And they should not work as this distracts from their reproduction. Women should be the subject to the authority of their husbands. Basically, Mussolini's main aim towards women was to encourage reproduction. Let's look more deeply into the personal lives of women. Fascists believe that they should remain housewives and give birth in order to increase the population for future military strength. An ideal fascist woman should have a well-rounded and sturdy appearance, as this was supposedly better for them as mothers. The state also criticised cosmetics, high heels, trousers for women, foreign fashion, and certain types of dancing. Meanwhile, they also had a very confused attitude towards female involvement in sport. While they believed it had health benefits and promoted discipline and national pride, they also believed that it distracts women against giving birth and encourages feminism, and apparently it also encouraged lesbianism. How ridiculous is that? Meanwhile, Mussolini had the irrational fear and belief that certain sports, such as riding, skiing and cycling, caused infertility. In terms of employment, the fascists began to limit job opportunities for women in order to leave more jobs for men and force women to stay at home, have children and look after their families. However, they were given some opportunities, such as the chance to serve on committees of the National Agency for Maternity and Childhood, known as ONMI a state organisation established in 1925 to help disadvantaged mothers. With regards to female education, women were to study living-related subjects, including training to stay at home and become a housewife and mother. Female teachers were excluded from prestigious teaching positions, such as Latin, Italian, history and philosophy, so that led them to taking up other teaching positions. Because Mussolini made it so much more difficult for women to find jobs, they had much more time on their hands and saw a chance to receive an education, and tried for more jobs, which would require even more education, which many men were also unlikely to have. As a result, the number of women at university increased from 6% in 1914 to 15% in 1938. On the topic of politics, fascist parliament gave women the right to vote in local elections in 1925, but as the fascists created a totalitarian state, women never had the opportunity to vote and practice universal suffrage. On the other side of religion, Pope Pius XI criticised the declining authority of men and stressed that women should be obedient housewives and caring mothers. Before I end this episode, I have to quickly discuss what a womanizer Mussolini was. He had a wife, Rochelle Mussolini, with whom he was married to from 1915 until his death, and had five children with. He also had numerous mistresses, most well known being Margarita Sarfati, who was actually a radical socialist and feminist, and Clara Petacci, who he was with from 1936 and was also executed with. Isn't that just a perfect love story? Thank you for listening to this episode of my podcast. The next episode would likely be the final episode of the series in which I review the extent of totalitarianism in fascist Italy. Please subscribe to be notified when the next episode is released. You can use the links in the description of this podcast to visit my website and also to leave valuable feedback on my Google form. You can also contact me and stay up to date using Instagram or Twitter. Thanks again and goodbye.